trapped in the middle of a chaos of wires and people shouting down microphones and watching monitor screens. The engineers are waiting here tonight to make television history. Pirate TV is to be like a pirate radio station, which is to have freedom over what you do rather than being controlled by the authority. I always like computer games, and I like computers and thought that they should be used for a different stuff than just accounting and word processing. When we got, got going with Cold Cut, we wanted to do uh, live shows and we wanted to be able to play with sound and visuals in a more fluid way than was possible with just kind of conventional tools. So Pirate TV is something we started I think it was around 1999 and that was the internet was just getting going and we wanted to be a Pirate TV station. Okay hello welcome back to PirateTV.net with myself Matt Black. Uh, we set up a a jamming facility at my studio Space Lab at Ninja Tune and started doing regular Wednesday night jams with guests who just come around, we get high, jam, stream it out on the net, audio and visual and chat with people in real time as well. So that was the start of Pirate TV. Fairly simple gear, a simple Panasonic video mixer, a couple of cameras, the Amiga computer to do some titles and graphics and uh, that and a couple of mics, but that was pretty much it. But that was, you know, a pirate TV station. That's really all you need. The whole point of doing it was that it was a live stream. Um, we knew we could just record stuff and play it out, but it, the idea that it, it was actually a two-way thing where you could chat with the people who were watching was very important. Of course, you don't get that with a pre-recorded stream. I've also, I've always found as well that doing stuff live gives it a kind of edgy element because you can fuck up, there is a risk and, um, you know, things tend not to go smoothly, but that, those bumps and that granularity, I think, makes for a more engaging experience for people and certainly more exciting for us as participants. So the main limitation when we started doing Pirate TV was bandwidth, basically, both for us doing the streams and for people tuning in, because most people were just on a dial-up modem, as indeed I was when I was at home. But in our building, which was in Clink Street in London, there was a wonderful company called Obsolete, and they'd been given this gig to do the, the Levi's website. This was just in the early days of the web, really, and um, Levi's paid for a fairly decent quality pipe to come into our building, and Obsolete very generously put this at the disposal of the other uh, companies and crews in the building. So when everyone had got home at night, we were able to jump on this. I think it was a 256K stream uh, 256k pipe which was you know pretty decent in those days and um, we would have to serve everyone tuning in from that 256k there was no restream there was no twitch nothing like it it was very small scale and really we couldn't serve more than about five to ten people off that connection the streaming software we used was called real player by real networks and they were sort of early players in this streaming idea um, and they wanted money for their server, which we didn't want to pay, so we had a cracked copy of it. Technical challenges were, were pretty uh, mind-boggling, really. Sometimes I look at some of our setups with, you know, 5,000 cables and scores of huge boxes and so on, and think we must have been insane. But then again, that setup was kind of a piece of art in its own right, I think. Um, but in a way, um, it was a kind of geeky computer game problem-solving uh, excitement that pushed us to try and make this work. Strange times, but nice to be able to connect electronically like this. As the pandemic got going and I was just sitting here isolated in the Cotswolds, I thought, well, I should do something. And uh, a friend said, look, you really should look at OBS and um, do some streaming. So I downloaded the software and it was a bit tricky, but I got my head around it. Definitely the old experience with Pirate TV fed into getting a handle on how, how this could be used. Um, and so I started streaming out just a, a test stream, actually, on the Cold Cut Facebook page one Saturday night. And then suddenly I had like 100 people watching. I was like, oh, OK, um, this, is, this is good. Twitch came up as a, as a freer channel, less subject to kind of Babylon control. 
and they were encouraging music to get going there and people to try different things. So, and I got talking to a couple of people at Twitch and they were well into Ninja Tune and Cold Cut and they were like, this is great, you know, you should keep doing this. So we were encouraged to make Twitch the kind of main platform for it really. It's interesting that very recently Twitch have been getting under pressure from the um, copyright infringement authorities and have now started to pressure streamers to uh, not play music which isn't their copyright, which of course for gamers is a massive problem because they don't have their own music. And, um, and even for ourselves, it's not as straightforward as you might think to say, hey, well, this is my track, I have the rights to play this. But actually on Twitch, they're, they're, there's a more direct relationship with the people doing the streaming, I think, and Twitch are a bit more awake to it. As an artist with my own music and as having our own label Ninja Tune, I feel that we ought to be able to stream out music which we have the rights to, so that should be a given, really. Jam Pro is a, a, a sample engine. It's a way of playing with samples, changing them, arranging them, manipulating them, mutating them, so that we can do a real-time rhythmic sample-based collage, basically. Um, it's a development from Ninja Jam, which we released in 2013, the first version. Um, and that is a development of DJAM, which is our the first engine like this, which we made in 1996, Faces said that what we've done with Jam is to reimagine the MPC. The MPC was the kind of hip hop sampling drum machine. With these touch controlled computers, we've been able to put in quite a lot of power and ability to have a lot of power right literally at your fingertips to sculpt and shape and composite the sounds in real time. It's exciting. And what we've got here are four different channels which here are labeled bass, leads, effects, and chords. They can be anything. And each channel, this is kind of um, a trap pack, so the bass and the drums are combined. And I've got eight different samples here, and I can chop between them instantaneously. Which is quite fun in its own right. And then I have other channels like this that I can bring in. And quite um, flexibly, I can just collage any of these sounds together. So if I just break it down track by track, we'll just listen to one of these tracks. You can put effects on like reverb, distortion, and each of these effects buttons here are actually a mini XY, we call this tip control. So just with small movements of your finger, you can quite subtly have a lot of fun and shape the sound. Delay. Quite flexible dub delay and a WOMP filter as well. And that is so for each of the four channels have their independent sets of effects. You can also control them with this XY here, which is a combined distortion, delay, reverb, and filter. And then um, each of the samples as well, let's go to this more hip hop drum break. Turn the reverb and the distortion off. And again, we call this the drill tuck. So I can loop a small part of the sample and then filter this direction and drill up and down, which is quite fun as well. We have, here we have stabs. So you can actually play it like an MPC. So these are intended to be real time and Jam is all about real time manipulation. I don't like going through menus. I don't like having to edit stuff. 
um, I don't want to think too much about what I'm doing. I just want to get in directly with the sound, which was part of the excitement of, of hip hop DJing. It's just you, your head, your ears, and your hands on the turntables manipulating sound directly. So you can load in your own samples. That's the big change from Ninja Jam, which was really just about remixing existing samples. Here we wanted to give you the full ability to put your own stuff into it. With Jam Pro, we've really put in a lot of power here. It's a bit like a modular synth. You never know what you're going to get with a modular, and it's similar with this app as well. It's got a lot of power to manipulate the sounds. Okay, quick run through my streaming setup. The heart of it is this laptop, and that's running OBS, which is a wonderful free software that lets you take different visual and audio sources, like this camera, for instance, and stream them out. Here's another camera by Brio, held in a slightly unconventional mount so that I can have it on these iPads. This one is running Jam Pro, Cold Cuts Beat Instrument, and this is running Algorithm DJ, so that I can DJ tracks in sync with Jam Pro. They're both rooted into a little line mixer here, as is the microphone, which I'm wearing, so you can't see it. If I turn up this auxiliary send, then I can get some dub effects using the Zen Delay by Ninja Tune. Here's a 20 quid Behringer sound card, which is what we use to get the sound into the laptop. And then moving over here to this other monitor, this is running Resolume on the same laptop. And Resolume is a wonderful VJ software so that I can take different clips and mix them together and get an output. So if I come down again to OBS and I select Resolume now, it will crossfade over into the output from Resolume and that's what I'll be streaming out. Over here I've got a little controller which I've got hooked up to Resolume to control different effects. So for example, if I turn that on, I can get this funky tunnel effect or I can fade sources in and out using that as well. This is an Ableton push for controlling Ableton. And here is a second-hand Herman Miller chair. Very important to have a decent chair if you're spending a lot of time in, the, in front of the computer, as I'm sure a lot of us do. And finally, very important, a cup of coffee. So this is Ninja's 30th birthday. It's 30 years since we started in 1990. And it does feel satisfying to still be around. Um, when I was 40, a friend of mine said, well, are you going to have a party? I said, well, I'm not sure. And she said, well, you should have a big party just to celebrate having survived that long. And I thought, you are absolutely right. Um, so just having been able to stick around that long in what is a pretty mad, competitive and cutthroat and odd business uh, is an achievement that I'm proud of. I'm also proud of having put out some great records and supported some great artists. And I'm proud of Ninja having successfully held some kind of flag up for the independent and alternative way of doing things over the years. Um, I think we started it with some good DNA and some good principles. No doubt we fucked up along the way and made our share of mistakes, but we're still here and we're still trying to get it right. That was wicked.